I feel like legacy is a, is a scriptural theme. It's a concept found in the Bible that we need to grab hold of. And if you haven't grabbed hold of this term, if you haven't held it and actually understand what it is, you will miss out on the most important things of your life because I'm telling you, legacy is what matters. And we take it from Psalms 112, verses five through six. It says, good will come to him who is generous. Everybody say generous and lends freely, who conducts his affairs with justice. Everybody say justice. Surely he will never be shaken. You're saying, wait a minute, I'll never be shaken? What about all the problems, all the issues I'm dealing with right now? I'm not telling you that the earth won't shake around you. I'm just telling you that you won't shake with it, okay? That God's going to sustain you, that he will be your portion. I just want to give you a, a, something for free. Everybody ready? For, this is free right here. If, if you want to make sure you get over your problems, you need something in your life that's bigger than your problems. And that has to be God. It has to be a foundation in his word. If you don't have God in your life, your problems will shake you to your core. And I feel like some of you are experiencing that right now. So I just want to give it that to you. That was free. Y'all can have that one, all right? But the next verse, it says, a, a righteous man, a righteous man will be remembered forever. That's legacy. It doesn't matter what age you are in this room. This sermon speaks to you. It doesn't matter what phase of life you're in. Legacy is something that's never too early or too late to begin to think about. A righteous man will be remembered forever. I want to talk to you guys about legacy for the next two Sundays. Father, thank you so much for what you're doing in our house. God, the Jefferson Church is just different. And I want to thank you so much that it is. It's not because of a pastor or a staff. It's because of the people and it's because of the Holy Spirit that resides here. So Holy Spirit, I'm asking that you would do what only you can do. I, I give you the heavy lifting, the heavy burden. I can't do it. God, I'm just going to be your open, willing vessel to be used by you right now to speak to the hearts and lives of people. But you do that the only way that you can. Thank you for all that you've done, all that you're going to do in our lives here today. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said, amen and amen. Legacy is something that is so important, yet it's not really talked about a whole lot. I realize I'm 35 years old and I'm talking to some people who are probably older than me. Uh, and uh, and, and a, a guy talking about legacy at 35 maybe seems a little bit different. But my mom has always said, I'm an old soul in a young body. Like I've always kind of been that way. I've always leaned towards kind of the older way of doing things, the older life, the older lifestyle. Uh, like I said, my mama raised me on Andy Griffith. Somebody say amen. You know, so like I, I understand, I understand Barney's bullet in his pocket. Like I understand it, you know, but um, I want to talk to you about what legacy really is and, and the, kind of the definition that we want to start on or base our discussion on is that legacy is basically it's where your life uh, lives on. It's where your life lives on. Legacy is what is here when you're gone. And some of y'all are like, we talking about death already on Sunday? Aren't you glad you came to church? You know, but it's, it's, basically, it's basically what lives on past you. It's not just your children. It's not just your grandchildren. But it's actually, it's the lessons. It's the life. It's the theme of your life that is really, really broken through and that everybody really sees. I knew I was going to talk about legacy for the last couple of weeks. And so I've been kind of thinking about examples and stories that I want to bring to you. And, and one of them actually came up a couple of days ago. We were driving. Uh, you know, yesterday, Judah was um, on a football team. They were at the Super Bowl. They won. But anyway, they were excited. Um, so they, they won. I was surprised I had a voice. I was screaming so loud. My son was like, Dad, why are you so excited? I'm like, you won the Super Bowl. He's like, yeah, it's cool. Fine, kid. Anyway, um, Brooklyn had a basketball game after that. So we were just going, 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 going. And I'm telling you that uh, when, we were, uh, when we were there in the car, we listened to a lot of Christian music. You're like, well, you're the pastor. Hey, guys, we listen to country music too. George Strait, big fan. You're like, we, we, listen, we listen to a lot of different styles of music. But we were listening to worship music most of the time. And there was this one song that was on. It was called, Oh, How I Need You. Jesus, Jesus, oh, how I need you. You stay the same. The bridge goes, you are powerful. God above it all, I believe in you. And as I was looking back, how many of you know as a father, sometimes the best pictures of your life are those rearview mirror pictures, you know? Like those are the pictures that you don't ever want to forget. And you might at some point in your life, but you don't ever want to forget. You want to always remember what those babies look like in the back of a car, all 12 of them. But anyway, um, 
you, you, look in that, <laughs> you look in that rearview mirror, and I saw Brooklyn, and as we were singing that song, she, her eyes weren't necessarily shut, but she was looking out the window, and you could just see there was passion in her face. Her eyebrows were like, she was just, she was singing it, you know, and, and Judah, I'm going to tell you right now, we both believe Judah going to be a preacher one day. He really, his, his eyes were shut. I mean, like, if they'd shut anymore, they'd have disappeared. I mean, like, he was, his eyes were closed so shut, like he was getting a shot or something, and he was, he was just, just praying, I mean, not praying, he was singing that song. Houston, he was just making a joyful noise. That's the only thing I can tell you about him. He was just letting it rip. I mean, he's, it's between singing and talking. We hadn't figured out which one it is yet, but, you know, he's, uh, he's, he was doing great things. And then even my little girl, I kid you not, my little girl, Georgia Beth, she's 14 months. You could see her head just kind of poking around, and every now and then you just kind of saw a hand kind of go up like this and then just kind of come back down. And I just, I'm just going to go ahead and tell you that's not on accident. That's not by mistake. My wife and I, we want to leave a legacy behind of children that know how to worship God and aren't ashamed to worship God and will worship God when the moment is right, when the moment's there, when the Spirit is in the car. And I'm telling you, the Spirit was in the car with us as we were driving down the road. But then I, I got to thinking about legacy. And I thought, you know, we don't worship, Chanel and I don't worship because we just w woke up one morning and knew how to worship. No, no, no. Like we saw people in our lives that, that were free worshipers and that could lift up their hands and they could sing and they could play instruments and, and they knew that it wasn't just standing there and looking at a screen, but it was, it was really passionately worshiping God. I thought about my mom. I thought about Chanel and her family at New Covenant in Athens. I thought about my mom. I thought about my granddaddy. You know, my granddaddy gets all the credit, but it was really my grandmother that sat all the kids around the piano and taught them harmony. And, and I can remember at Church of the Nations, my mom, she would sit, single mom, she would sit me and my sister, stand us up on pews, and as she was singing and worshiping, doing this, she would lean over and let us hear the harmony that she was singing. That's how my sister and I learned how to sing harmony. And, and then it went all the way back to my grandfather, my grandmother, and their grandparents. And I'm telling you, in our family, there is a legacy of worshipers. There's a legacy of knowing how to worship and how to freely do that. And that's a legacy that we are leaving behind that will not fade, that we are continually carrying in in our life. And so when it comes to legacy, it's, it's not just about worship, it's about giving. It's not just about giving, it's about living your life. And so if you're talking about giving in the f f uh, focus or in the span of legacy, giving is something that outlives me. That's what giving is. Giving is giving to something or allowing my resources to fund something that's going to outlive me because that's what legacy is all about is giving something or doing something that will be here when you are long gone, but then also living your life with a purpose. You've got to live your life so that what you are living for outlives, next slide for me guys, so that what you are living for outlives you. I don't, I don't know, you know, in, in this day and age, we're all about living longer, longevity, healthier lives, healthier lifestyles. I think that's great. Uh, but, but the goal of your life is not to live long on earth. That's not the goal of your life. The goal of your life, actually the purpose of your life, the reason why you were made is to leave something here that does last a long time. That's really the purpose of your life. And you say, well, I haven't lived long enough. I don't have enough time. I beg to differ I've probably done more funerals in the last year or two than I've done ever in my life. And, and, and I've done funerals of young kids, 15-year-olds and 20-year-olds and 30-year-olds, and, and that didn't have the time that a lot of us have had to leave a legacy behind. But guess what? They left something behind that lasted. They left something behind that their friends will always talk about, that their friends and their family will always remember. So this idea of legacy is not just for the old, but it's for the young too. It's not just for the ones that have retirement, 401Ks, and, and, and you're traveling around the world in RV. It's, it's, not, it's not just that. It's for the mom and the dad that you just started having kids. It's for the ones that are in college and you haven't had kids yet. And it's for, it's for everybody in this room. Maybe you're single. Maybe you're you know, just married or just got divorced. Whatever. I'm telling you, leaving something behind that last is what will matter in your life. And when you look back, that's what will be important. It's a concept that's talked all through New Testament and the Old Testament that we're supposed to be living our life on mission. If there's one thing I could tell you that you need to hear, everybody in this room, listen to me. You were made on purpose for a purpose. You were made on purpose for a purpose. No matter how you came into this world, you were not a mistake. You were not an accident. You were made on purpose for a purpose. And it's my job, my calling, my responsibility as the shepherd and the pastor, the guide of this church, so to speak, is that I want to help you not only in this life here on earth, 
but I want to help you when you get to the other life. Now, I, I, everybody's like, well, he's getting real spiritual right now. It's not very spiritual to understand one day everybody in this room is going to die. One out of one. Aren't you glad you came to church, right? One out of one. Everybody is going to pass through. And on the other side, when you take that final breath and it's gone, the Bible says that's when your eternal existence begins. Your life is about this big. Your eternity is about that big. And I would be doing you a disservice if I didn't prepare you for both. About legacy here and legacy there as well. Romans chapter 14 says this, you then, why do you judge your brothers and sisters? In other words, why are, you, why are you so caught up in everything that's going on right now? Don't worry about them. Or why do you treat them with contempt? For we will all stand before God's judgment seat. It is written, as surely as I live, says the Lord, every knee will bow before me, and every tongue will acknowledge God. It doesn't matter your age, it doesn't matter your beliefs here, it doesn't matter if you think you're right here and everybody else is wrong, it won't matter on the day when you meet God face to face, and I need everybody to understand me when I say this, no matter who you are, race, color, creed, religious background, or beliefs, everybody one day will see God face to face. Everybody will. Every knee will bow, every tongue will bow before me, every tongue will confess or acknowledge, and so then each of us will give an account of what we've done with our life. We will talk about the legacy. We will talk about what we left behind, and we will do that, give that to God. When you meet God, I want to help you, not only in the life now, but in the life after. I want to help you in what's going to happen when you get to heaven. The Bible says there are two judgments, and God's going to ask you two questions. I wasn't very good at school. I, was, I'm, I mean, I'm a smart guy, um, but in, in high school, I just got by because um, I was in class all the time. I could just absorb that way. I didn't really have to study. I was a pretty good student in high school. I got to college. I didn't have good habits when I got to college, and I found out that there were much more interesting things to do at college than go to class. Anybody know what I'm talking about, right? So I didn't go to class very much, didn't do very well uh, first couple years in college, and um, I, a matter of fact, I took a calculus test, true story, took a calculus test, and everybody else got numbers grades back. They got 65, 75, 82, 93, 100. They got, you know, that kid that killed the curve. Nobody likes that kid. But anyway, you know, uh, everybody got number grades back. True story, my professor wrote no on the top of my page, <laughs> underlined it, asterisk, see me after class. I wasn't, that, I wasn't that good at school, but I found out I was still pretty smart, still pretty intelligent. I actually found out that you could go to the library and you could buy the professor's old tests. Now, they changed the numbers, changed the figures, changed the questions. You know, multiple choice is the worst thing in God's creation. You know what I'm talking about? Like, oh, A looks really good. B, you, ooh, B looks really good. C, uh, let's just go all the above. You know, like it's terrible. But you could, you could see some of these tests that they would do from, from before and study and kind of get to know the feel, the context, the content of what was getting, getting ready to be tested on. And that's kind of what I want to do to you for you right now is I don't know exactly how it's going to happen. I don't know if he's going to call us up like kind of you're waiting for meat in the meat line at the grocery store. I don't know if that's like number 355. I don't know like if that's, going to, if that's how it's going to work. But I know the basic context. I know the content of what's going to happen and kind of what's going to be asked, so to speak. And so I want to help you, not only about our legacy in our life right now, that's coming in just a minute, but also what's going to be asked of you, what's going to be done when you get to heaven the first thing that he's gonna ask you, I promise you, is something like this. What did you do with my son, Jesus? What did you do with my son, Jesus? I, I wanna tell you that Jesus came to this world. Whether you believe it or not, he came to this world. He was a real man, real person, and we believe he was God in flesh, that he came as our Savior, lived a sinless, spotless, perfect life, one that we could not live. He lived it as an example for us, and as he uh, lived that life, he was crucified uh, un unjustifiably. He was crucified, but after three days, he rose again. He ascended back into heaven, and he said one day he's going to come back. That's the gospel. Jesus did that, and I want to tell you that he also preached preached about heaven, but he also preached about hell. He talked about both. Po uh, contrary to popular belief, hell is not a place God sends people that he hates. Hell is a place that people choose to go to when they don't choose Jesus. It, it, I'll take it like this. If you go to a restaurant and you want to pay the bill for your food and somebody is offering to pay it for you, you have a choice. 
Do you want them to pay your bill or do you want to pay your bill? And in essence, in life, people who don't choose Jesus, no, I'm going to pay for my own bill. I'm going to do it myself. I can do it my own way. I'm a self-made man, self-made woman. I can do this myself. In essence, that is the reason why people go to hell, not because God hates them and not because God is upset with them. In no way. It's because they choose to pay the penalty, the bill for their own sin instead of giving their life to Jesus and allowing him to pay the penalty. That's the basis of it all, that he gave his life for you. And all he wants in return is for you to return the favor and give your life back to him. So this great white throne judgment, also called the grace judgment, you will be asked, what did you do with my son Jesus? And here's the right answer. You might want to take this down. This will be tested later on, okay? This will be on the test. What was the right answer? Well, I believed in him, and I knew him personally. I knew him personally. The Bible says in the book of Matthew that one of the scariest verses in all of Scripture, it, he, Jesus said this, many will come to me on that day and said, Lord, didn't we go to church? Didn't we prophesy? Didn't we do miracles? Didn't we cast out demons? Didn't we join connect groups? Didn't we lead? Didn't we do this? Didn't we give in the offering? Come on, didn't we do all these things? And he's going to say, that's not what counts. That's not what matters. What matters is that you believed in my son Jesus and you knew him personally. You were a follower of Jesus Christ. That's what matters. And he says, if you don't have that answer, he'll say, depart from me, I never knew you. So the right answer is, I believed in him, and I knew him personally. The second judgment, and the second question, some of y'all maybe have never heard this before, but this is, this is the Bible, I can show it to you in scripture. The second question he will ask you is he'll say, at the works judgment or the mercy seat, what did you do with what I gave you? Now that I know you've given your life to Jesus, I know that you know him and that you followed him, you have a personal relationship with Jesus, okay, there's one more judgment. This isn't heaven or hell, you're going to heaven. But he says, hey, I, I, I want to know, what did you do with what I gave you? What did you do with the gifts that I gave you? What did you do with the talents? What did you do with the resources that I gave you? What did you do with what I gave you and entrusted to you on this earth? What did you do to help change people's lives? Because everybody in this room, you are endowed with gifts. You are endowed with treasures. You are endowed with abilities and, and, and ways of doing things that nobody else can do. God gave that to you, and until you realize you have to do something with that, until you find your purpose, here again, you were made on purpose, for a purpose, until you find that God-given purpose and do something with it, you will not be happy in this world. You will not be happy in this life. It will be momentary. He says, what did you do? with what I gave you, and the right answer is, here again, it will be tested, the right answer is, I gave it away. This life, this ability, these gifts, this talent, these resources that you gave me, I didn't hoard them, I didn't keep them, I didn't save them up all for myself and my family, no, 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 I gave them away. In other words, we need to start, watch this, watch this, we need to start living our lives in such a way that we realize our life is not about us. Your life's not about you. When you go to work, it's not about you. When you come to church, it's not about you. When you raise kids, it's not about you. Your life is not about you. Your whole life is about making a difference. Your whole life is about leaving something behind that matters. It's about legacy. Your whole life is about leaving something behind that matters. About doing something now that allows you, receiving Jesus, doing something with the gifts he's given you, But the question is, Pastor Nick, how can we have legacy? How can we leave something behind that matters? I'm here to tell you, you have been forewarned for everybody in this room, listen to me, eternity is one breath away. Eternity is one moment away, one wrong turn, one wrong step, one wrong move. Eternity is one moment away. And because of that, if we want to do something now, today, that leaves a legacy, leaves something behind that matters, you've got to be intentional. You can't just oops. No, nobody oops into retirement. Nobody oops into the final years of their life. And nobody oops has a bunch of money in the bank to now retire on. No, no, you have to be intentional with the resources, intentional with the life, the body that God has given you. You've got to be intentional. Three ways that we can be intentional. Three ways we can leave a legacy. I want you to write these down. I want you to take pictures. Whatever you gotta do, just, just get these in your mind. Three ways that God wants us, how we can leave a legacy. We gotta do it intentionally. The first way, we have to intentionally give what we have. Intentionally give what we have. In other words, the things that you give to in your life, and I'm, I'm talking about in so many different ways, right? Like, like, let's talk about resources, finance for a second. The things that you give to, do they really matter? 
the things that you give to, the things here at the end of the year, you know, we have our legacy offering coming up at the end of the year. Things that you give to, do they really matter? Are they gonna leave a legacy behind? You have so much in your life that you can give, but you have to choose to do it. You have to be intentional about it. For instance, you all have teeth. You're like, you want me to give my teeth away? No, 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 I'm not saying that. You all have teeth. You know what you can give? A smile. A smile can change somebody's day. I can't tell you how many testimonies I have heard of people who have walked through those doors thinking that this was going to be a judgmental, I don't like you, you're going to hell, you filthy, stinking sinner, you. Like, I can't tell you how many people said they were not excited about coming here until they walked through those doors and somebody smiled at them. You can give a smile. That's a resource you have. You know what? Everybody's got thumbs. Come on, do this. This was the original emoji, everybody. When you wanted to say something to somebody without giving words, a picture. You know what you can do? You can give a thumbs up. In other words, you can encourage people. You can use your thumbs and text. You know, some of y'all with long fingernails, you like this. But, like, um, you, you can use your, your hands to give uh, generous, I mean, to, to give encouragement to people. What can I give? What do I have to give? You have resources that God's endowed you with. You have, you have things, you have extra, you have leftover, you have all these things that God's given you and God wants you to not only use those but use your life intentionally. Listen to me, use your job intentionally. Use your body intentionally. Use your mind intentionally. Second Corinthians chapter nine leaves no excuse for every, anybody. You will be enriched in every way. You will be enriched in every way. Well, I don't feel very rich. Guess what? You're in America. You're rich. Guess what you did this morning? You got out of your plush bed with several pillows, right? You got in your running water shower. You, you took your jammies off before you got in there. Then you put on your church clothes. You're going to go home and put on your lounge clothes. Then you're going to put on your golf clothes or your work around the house clothes. Then you're going to put on another set of, of clothes that are called your bedroom clothes at the end of that. And you got different shoes to go with every outfit. And that's day one. There are people in this world that only have one of what you have a closet full of. You're wealthy. If you have a checking account, doesn't matter how much is in there, if you have enough to open a checking account, you are wealthier than 86% of the world, of the world. You're wealthy. We're well off. And the Bible says you will be enriched in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion. And through us, your generosity will result in thanksgiving. In other words, your, your generosity will result in people being pointed to Jesus. You need to be intentional with how you give. Not only with your resources, but your time, your energy, your focus, and your life. You need to be intentional with that. You say, well, Pastor Nick, how do I do that? It would be awful if I got up here and told you how to, like, what to do and not how to do it. I want to give you something practical. And as I was thinking this morning, just this morning, off the top of my head, I was thinking, how can people intentionally give what they have? Here's three ways you can do. Number one, you can become a percentage giver, not a, not a tipper, okay? God doesn't want you to tip him. God says 10%. He says, 10% of what you bring in, I want you to return to me because I've given you 100, I want you to give me 10, and I'm gonna bless the 90 to go further than the 100 ever would. Does everybody see what I just said there? 90-day uh, tithe challenge, we, 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 can't, we can talk about it again. He says, when you give me 10, I will take the 90 and make it stretch further than the 100% ever would on your own by yourself. If you trust me with your finances and you become a percentage giver, he said, I will open up the windows of heaven and bless your socks off. I will do that. You have to trust him. You gotta take that next step. You gotta give him so you got to uh, have faith for that. The second thing is there's a legacy offering. We talked about it last Sunday of the year. Everybody say last Sunday of the year. There's a legacy offering that we're doing because we want to leave behind something that matters. The mill that's coming that we're talking about, the offering's going to, listen, we, we're talking about what the mill and what all is going to happen there. It's going to be an amazing, amazing Sunday, but that offering is something you can be intentional with, something you can plan for now, think about now. What do we need to do? What do we need to give to that? Third thing, third way you can intentionally give is we actually pulled out uh, acts of kindness cards. We had them a couple of months ago and, and kind of nobody picked them up anymore. Well, I want to rev that back up. You know, this is the season of giving. This is a season of thinking about other people and not just thinking about yourself. And I want you to do this. I want you to pick up a card. If you feel so led, I want you to pick up a card out here on the glass table. And as you pick up a card, I want you to pay for the person's coffee behind you. I want you to pay for the meal behind you. I want you to order pizza for somebody's house, not 100 pizzas for somebody's house, now that'd be awful, but order one pizza for somebody's house and send it to them. 
But when you do that, can I ask you something? If you do that and they don't know how, who did it or why, it doesn't help. But when you put a card, and the card says something like this, says something like that, something like this, we love you so much, and Jesus loves you so much, we thought you needed something special today. That's all it says. But they need to know that Jesus loves them, and they can find that and see that through your generosity and through your giving. Second way, musicians, you can come. Second way that you can intentionally do something to leave a legacy is you can intentionally serve people. Intentionally serve others. Some of y'all are like, Pastor Nick, I just got to this church. (laughs) I just warmed the pew, and now you're pushing me to a team. You're pushing me into ministry. You're pushing me to do all this stuff. I don't like being pushed. And here's what I would say to that. If you are here and you just need to take a break, that's fine. Take a break. But some of y'all have been taking a break for 30 years. (laughs) Hurt, didn't it? I understand taking a break. I get it. But at some point, you need to get going. At some point, you need to see, to leave a legacy, I have to intentionally do some things. Muscles don't just grow on their own. You have to work them, intentionally do something to build those muscles. In the same way, serving is a muscle that can be used to God's glory in your life and can affect change around people around you like never before. But you have to intentionally use it. Matthew 20 says this, Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be a servant. Hey, in in God's kingdom, in God's paradigm, in God's world, if you want to be great, it's not about being a king or having the most this or having the most power. No, no, no. It's about being lower and lowering yourself to serve other people. And whoever wants to be first must be your slave. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. So not only can we intentionally give, but we can intentionally serve. Okay, Pastor Nick, now I know what I need to do, but how can I do that? I'm so glad you asked. I'm glad we have such inquisitive people here today. Here's how you can do it. Three ways, real quick, three ways. Give them to me on screen, three ways. The first one is growth track. You want to know how people get name tags and how they stand at doors and do the coffee for you that you don't even know they do, but, you know, somebody has to fill those coffee pots up. Somebody's back there holding your kids right now so that you can be in service. Somebody is up in the J Youth Building with Pastor Corey back there with Pastor Kayla, and they're, they're helping, they're serving, and they're giving part of their life. They're using their calling on purpose, for a purpose, for a greater mission than themselves. They're serving people, and that all started with Growth Track. First and second Sunday of every month, come and be a part of it, and then we will show you where, where you can serve and where you can help. We call them door holders. That doesn't mean you're going to be holding a door all the time. That means you might be in the parking lot. You might be on stage singing. You might be up in the sound booth doing production. You might be in J Kids, J Youth. Wherever you feel like you want to serve, we're not going to force you to do something, you know, like smile. We're not going to do that, okay? But it's like like we call them door holders because we believe everybody, whether you're holding a baby for a mom and dad in this room or you're watching a middle schooler and teaching them the gospel while mom and dad are here, or whether you're on stage and singing and leading people in worship, we believe everybody is holding a door open for people to meet Jesus. That's why we call them door holders. Growth track's important. That's how you can intentionally begin to serve people. You can, you can lead a connect group. Get involved and lead one. We've, we've led several in our, in our time here at the Jefferson Church, and can I tell you something? We need, we need more. We start off with four, and I think now we have something close to 50, but we need more. We, we need more people need connected, more people need life, more people need connection with other people so that they can go through life. Because can I tell you something? People are hurting. And they need you. They need your experiences. They need your leadership. You say, well, I'm not a leader. Maybe not in the certain influences and spheres you want to be in, but I guarantee you people are following you. I promise you're a leader. You need to be involved in that. This Sunday, hey, you, you talk about not, not just like in the future. This Sunday, we got turkey drop. We're going to Jefferson, and we're handing out 100 turkeys. You know what you got to do? Show up. You know what you got to do? Hand a turkey off to somebody at the door. Hey, how can I pray with you? Hey, is there anything I can do for you? Hey, I want you to know Jesus loves you. Man, we just want to give this to you absolutely free, no, no strings attached. Here you go. That's serving people. When you do something like that, that's what leaves legacy behind. You intentionally serve others. Third and final thing, though. You intentionally share Christ with them. 
That's how you leave a legacy. A lot of Sundays can be about you if you want them to be. I need filling. I need healing. I need a good Holy Spirit moment. I need to get my family in church. It can be a lot about you if you want to be. But can I just tell you something? We're giving you the opportunity as a church. Three Sundays out of this year are not about you. The first three Sundays in December are not about you. They're about people you're going to bring. They're about people you're going to invite. Movies have a way of disarming people. Move, uh, the, the way we're going to just do this church up from head to toe, it has a way of disarming people and kind of throwing people in the spirit of Christmas, which is really about Jesus Christ anyway. So in this way, when you intentionally bring and intentionally invite, intentionally share Christ, I thought about this the other day. Not you, thought about me. When was the last time I shared Jesus with somebody and I wasn't on the stage? When was the last time I invited people to a relationship with Jesus and I didn't have a microphone in my hand? I can honestly tell you it's probably been weeks or months since it's happened. But now I want to ask you, when was the last time you invited somebody to a relationship with Jesus? When was the last time that because of your lifestyle, they looked at you and said, I want what you have, what's going on? And you point them to Jesus. Or you could point them to church. Hey, let the church do the heavy lifting. Hey, come on. We're having Chris at the movies. It's great. Come on. They're going to have free giveaways and little Debbie snack cake Christmas trees. Bless God. You know, like they're going to give those things away. We could sell them for 50 bucks a pop, but we're giving them away, everybody. I'm just telling you, it's a big deal. But you got to be intentional about it. You got to be intentional about it. You know, I, I know what you're thinking. You're like, well, if I invite somebody, Pastor Nick, y'all better do the good songs. You know what I'm talking about. I, y'all better do the good songs, you know. I had one lady one time <laughs> stop me in the foyer. I, I know her name, her face. She goes to church here. She uh, stopped me in the foyer. She said, I brought my friend today from work. I'm so excited. I was like, girl, I'm so excited for you. Like, we are just jumping up and down the hall, out of the foyer. I was like, I'm so excited. She's like, all right, don't blow it. <laughs> Pressure. Pressure. <laughs> Well, you know what I told her? The same thing I'm going to tell you. The Sunday you invite somebody, when I say every head bowed and every eye closed, I'm giving you permission to peek. You can, you can look at that person you sit next to. And the moment, I promise you, the moment that hand goes up and they give their life to Jesus, it's the best Sunday you've ever had in your life. I promise you. But you got to be intentional about it. If you want to leave a legacy, it doesn't happen by accident. Intentionally give. Intentionally serve people. Intentionally share Jesus with people. I love what 2 Corinthians 5 says. So we are Christ's ambassadors. God is making his appeal through us. Watch this. God doesn't have a plan B. The church is it. We are God's plan. We are the hope of the world. The church is. He is making his appeal through us. We speak for Christ when we plead, hey, hey, come back to God. Hey, come on. It doesn't matter what you've done. We're not going to judge you. You can wear what you want. As long as it covers up stuff, you can come on in. It's fine. No big deal. No judgment. You can wear what you want. The pastor wears sneakers on stage. Come on. Come back to God. Luke 14. Well then, said the master, Go out into all the country lanes and out behind the hedges and urge everyone, anyone you find to come so that my house may be full. You know what I'm praying for for the first three Sundays of December? I'm praying for a full house. Not because it's what a pastor wants, it's because it's what God wants. I want my house full. Third scripture, he says, Jesus said to his followers, Mark 16, Jesus said to his followers, go everywhere in the world, and just tell people the good news. Tell them what God's done in your life. Tell them that you were once headed for hell. Now you're headed for heaven. And this is my prayer for you. Actually, my charge for you. First Timothy chapter 6. Timothy is a pastor, a protege of Paul. And Paul is talking to Timothy. He says, hey, I want you to look at your congregation and say this. So I'm, I'm literally saying, I'm, I'm talking scripture to you. Ready? Command those who are rich in this present world. Do we need to go over how wealthy you are again? 
command those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant, nor to put their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain, but to put their hope in God, who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. Command them to do good. Command them to do good deeds, to be rich in good deeds, which is serving. Command them to be generous, which is giving. Command them to be willing to share, which is sharing the gospel. In this way, watch this, they will lay up treasures for themselves. A legacy will be laid up, a firm foundation for the coming age so that they may take hold of the life that is true life. When I was a couple years ago, many of you probably don't know who my granddaddy was. My granddaddy was a pastor for, I think, over 60 years. I mean, he, he started his ministry at 20 and passed away in his 90s, so, you know, 60, 70 years. He was, he was a pastor for a long time. In this area, Athens, uh, Franklin County, Madison County, Jackson County, he, he was in this area for a long time. And I, I'll never be like him. I can't, I can't live up to that expectation. But I can learn from him, glean from him. Greatest man I ever knew. I mean, he could, he could out-pastor and out-work. Out, he, he, he was a bricklayer. He was a farmer, uh, raised five kids, to, uh, uh, sang in groups with him, traveled the country, had a record, had a bus, and then pastored a church at the same time. I mean, he was an amazing guy, really was. Highest character of any man I've ever known. And before he died, a couple years before he died, it was probably the last, like, coherent conversation we had with one another, where I knew he knew what I was talking about. He's in his early 90s, and we're out on his back porch, his, his, his carport, he called it. And he's sitting in a blue wicker chair, and I'm sitting right there next to him. And I don't know, like, you know, just those moments where you just realize, okay, this is something special here. And I asked him, I said, hey, granddaddy, what matters? What matters the most? I was waiting for him to say family, you know, God, church, be a good man, you know be a pastor, root for the bulldog, something like that. I don't know. I was waiting for him to say something really, really just dynamic, and I didn't get it, or at least I didn't until I thought about it later on. I asked him, I said, hey, granddaddy, what matters most? He looked at me, he said, son, people matter most. People. He said, when I preach, when I sing, when I serve, when I give, when I share the gospel, he said, I'm doing it because people are all that matter. Can I tell you something? This season that we're in, I want to encourage you with something. That baby's just saying amen. He's fine. He's good. He's talking more than y'all talk all day long. That's good. Hey, listen, this season, people are all that matter. And if we want to leave a legacy for the generations behind us to follow, because they're the people that matter. You have to intentionally give. You have to intentionally serve. You have to intentionally share. Can we bow our heads and close our eyes just for a moment? God, I think that's the, that's the greatest tragedy of our world today is that people just let life pass them by. So much has been given. So much has been sacrificed. So much has been done just to give us the life that we are in right now. And yes, yeah, not always perfect. And yes, yeah, not always easy. But man, there's nothing like it. And for our life to truly add up, the worst thing would be to be good at something that doesn't matter or to spend our life on something that doesn't matter. Because if it doesn't stand up to eternity, if it doesn't leave a legacy, I'm just here to tell you, it doesn't matter. So I wanna ask you today, are you living intentionally? Are you waking up every day, centering yourself, getting around God's word, praying, saying, God, today I wanna live on mission, on purpose, for a purpose. I need to live intentionally. I need to give. I need to share. I need to serve intentionally. Maybe that's you today. But for many of us to start our legacy journey, to start our legacy life, you need to take the first step. 
You need to give your life to Jesus. Hey, hey, I know, hey, I know that I know it's difficult. I know it's hard. I know it's different. But can I tell you something? <laughs> you need Jesus. The thing that's missing in your life is Jesus. The thing that the void that cannot be filled, you're trying to fill it with so much other stuff, drugs, alcohol, you're trying to fill it with family, you're trying to fill it with relationships, you're trying to fill it with work, you're trying to fill it with success, trophies of life. That void cannot be filled except through Jesus Christ. So I want to ask you today, you're here and you say, Pastor Nick, I need to give my life to Jesus for the first time. Or maybe you say, I said a prayer a long time ago, but man, my life has gone the exact opposite direction of where I know it should be going. And today I want to firmly put my foot in the ground and turn the other way. I want to take my first step towards Jesus. Maybe first step in a long time, maybe first step ever, but today I want to give my life to Jesus. If that's you, I'm not going to embarrass you. I'm not going to call you out on the front. It's not how we do it here. Salvation is just between you and God. But you say, I want to do that. I just want to pray with you right where you are. Would you just lift up your hand and say, today I want to give my life to Jesus. Today. Right now. Don't wait. Do it right now. For anybody here that you say, today's the day for me. I want to surrender. I want to give my life to Jesus. Could you just lift up your hand? Just a few more seconds. Yeah, there's one hand right there. I was waiting. I just felt like there was somebody. I just felt like there was somebody. You know how excited I am for one person? <laughs> you know how many Sundays we'd had 8, 10, 12, 15? But the Bible says that Jesus, the shepherd who represents God, left for the one. It was the one that mattered. And so that one that lifted up your hand today before God, I want to say I'm proud of you. I'm thankful for your honesty. I'm thankful for your courage and your faith. The Bible says to confess with our mouth and believe in our heart that Jesus Christ is Lord and we will be saved. It's that simple. It's that simple. As you lift up your hand, you said, I need Jesus. I believe he's the son of God. He died for my sins and I'm accepting his forgiveness right now. But the Bible says to confess it with our mouth. So today, as you say it out loud, our whole church family will say it out loud as well. Say, dear Jesus, thank you so much for giving me my life. I know that I'm supposed to live it for you. And so right now, I surrender my life. I give it away to you. Do with it what you will. Say, I surrender my past, I surrender my present, and I surrender my future. Help me, Father, to live a life that I never thought possible. Say, I believe Jesus is the Son of God, and I believe today I am saved and different forevermore. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said, hey, one person gave their life to Jesus, everybody. Isn't that awesome? Hey, let's stand to our feet. Come on, let's sing.